Well, today in the church calendar, we begin ordinary time and the long green season. It'll last until the first Sunday of Advent. And in the summertime, in ordinary time, the first lesson in the lectionary follows the Old Testament story. Last year, if you were here in the summer and paying attention, you heard the first reading go from the creation through the stories of Adam and Eve and their family, Abraham and Sarah and their family, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and his brothers and him being sold off and ending up in Egypt. Moses' long rebellion in, in Egypt with the people and their promise from God that they could leave and they cross the Red Sea and eventually enter into the Promised Land. This year, the first readings begin with the story of Samuel. He's a child in the temple today. Samuel in the Bible is a prophet whose life was intimately connected with King Saul and King David. The story of these kings of Israel that you find in 1st and 2nd Samuel is better than a soap opera. It has all the dramatic tension of a spy movie, the nastiness of real housewives of wherever, and the family drama that could rival succession. So I encourage you to get a modern Bible translation, something with maybe a storyline or easier language, and read First and Second Samuel for yourself. The Sunday lectionary kind of dips in and out of the story, and you have a hard time getting the full flow, and it doesn't have quite the excitement of the original. If you want to read your real Bible, you go there and look in those first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are called the law. And then we get a segment, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and then First and Second Samuel, that tell the story of the history of the people in the promised land that God gave them. So today we begin with the people of Israel after they've been in the promised land for many generations. God gave them possession of the land, but he, they did have to fight for it. They had to evict the previous inhabitants. God's covenant with his people required that to stay in this holy land, they had to observe the commandments and remain separate from the people around them. By the time we get to today's story from 1 Samuel, the Hebrews have become a strong and thriving nation state. They live in that land of milk and honey that God promised them back when they were in the wilderness. The time is really about 1,100 years before Jesus was born. The 12 tribes of Israel have become a nation state, united and led by the covenant that they made with one God, their Lord. The people had settled into this kind of collective government style that united the 12 tribes. The tribe of Levi provided people to do the religious work, to work in the temple, and they were supported by taxpayer money. Amazing, huh? Eli and his sons, in today's story, were of that priestly tribe, and they worked in the religious system supported by these taxes. Other tribes ran farms and ranches and businesses and served in the military. These people needed armies almost continually because they were still kind of fighting with the people they had evicted from the land. And big invading armies from Assyria and Egypt would sweep across the land and try to take them over. They were really governed internally by local officials for the most part. 
and by a series of judges that would be sent by God to lead the people. They would help out in war sometimes, and they would also resolve disputes, and they would set up periods where things were not chaotic, where things were peaceful and organized. The Bible says that each judge repeatedly brought peace and order in their lifetime. And after their death, all the people would each go their own way and do what they thought was best. And when things began to go bad, when war threatened or famine came, the people would turn back to the Lord. When things were good, people would turn their back on the Lord and go do their own thing. Generation after generation in this part of the Bible, people alternate between faithfulness to God and turning away from God and being brought back to God. In this cycle of stories where we begin with Samuel, we begin with his parents, a devout and childless couple from the hill country of Ephraim. Their names were Elkanah and Hannah. Now, Elkanah was not childless because Hannah was his second wife. And she was really persecuted by the people in the household because she didn't have any children. And because her husband showed preferential love to her. So she went with her husband on an annual pilgrimage to the temple, to the shrine at Shiloh, and prayed to God, please relieve me of this misery and give me a son. And if you do, I'll consecrate him to God's service. Now, Eli was the priest at this temple at the time, and Hannah's prayer must have been very fervent. She was like moving her lips while she was praying and apparently thrashing around a little. And the priest came to her and said, Lady, are you drunk? This is in the Bible. You can go read it. She explained her problem to the priest and he blessed her and sent her on her way. And God heard Hannah's prayer and he sent her a son. She named him Samuel. And as soon as he was barely old enough to leave home, very small, she brought him back to the temple, dedicated him to God, and left him there. The good news for Hannah is that she later had three more sons and two daughters. Her prayer of joy is found in the Bible, and it rivals that of Mary's song, the Magnificat, which we all know. It's a hymn of justice like the Magnificat. Let me read you a few verses. God brings death and God brings life, brings down to the grave and raises up. God brings poverty and God brings wealth. He lowers, but he also lifts up. He puts poor people on their feet again. He rekindles burned out lives with fresh hope restoring dignity and respect to all their lives, a place in the sun. So living in the temple as he grew, Samuel was a helper to the priests. He even had a little linen apron like the priests wore. And every year his mother would come to the temple and bring him new clothes she had made since he had grown. And the boy thrived and grew in favor with the people who saw him around the temple. In today's story, it's one of the times when the Bible says spiritual light was dim. People didn't have visions and the people had fallen away from God. Eli was getting old. He was apparently blind. And his sons were out of control, and they were running the family business. The implication is they were corrupt. One modern Bible translation puts it this way. Eli's own sons were nothing but trouble. They didn't know God and could not have cared less about the customs of the priests among the people. 
They were far gone in disobedience and refused to listen to a thing their father said. So God, who was fed up with them, decreed their death. But the boy Samuel was very much alive, growing up, blessed by God, and popular with the people. At the end of chapter 2, just before the passage that you heard this morning, a holy man came to Eli at the temple with a terrible message from God. God warned Eli that his family was going to be destroyed. He would be removed from power and his sons would both be killed on the same day. And that whatever was left of his family would be starving and begging for food at the temple. Eli now knew what was coming, but he was powerless to stop it. Now today's story is the part that you usually got to hear in Sunday school, right? You've got this little boy Samuel sleeping in the temple. Eli's off in his bedroom. And Samuel has a voice go, Samuel, Samuel. The boy thought it was his master Eli and ran to see what he needed. Eli says, I was sleeping, go back to bed. And it happened again and then again. And finally it dawned on Eli that God was calling Samuel. And he sent him back to answer God, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And God told Samuel the same message, that Eli's time was up, the priestly family would fall due to their corruption. And the next day, Eli asked Samuel what God had said. And not surprisingly, Samuel didn't want to tell him, but he did. And faithful Eli, said, it is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. And the words and the prophecy turned out to be true. Eli's sons were killed in a battle and the Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines. Eli was so distraught by the loss of the Ark and the death of his sons that he fell off a bench and died. It became clear very early that Samuel was a prophet of God with a special connection to understand God's will. Our closing verse from today's reading in the modern translation says, Samuel grew up, God was with him, and Samuel's prophetic record was flawless. Everyone in Israel, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, recognized that Samuel was the real thing, a true prophet of God. God continued to show up at Shiloh, revealed through the word of Samuel. Next week, you get to pick up the story, but Samuel jumps to being a prophet with sons of his own. These stories, these stories of God and his people that we hear from the Old Testament are still important for us today. We hear in the Hebrew Bible how over generations and centuries God was faithful to his people. God fulfilled his promises as he said he would even when the people turned away, he called them back and restored them to their place in his heart. Time and again, we get to hear how God moved. We hear about the relationship that God had with people, with families, with nations, and these stories can guide us into how we should live our lives as people, as families, as nations. They're meant to guide us in godly love, godly truth, and justice. 
In the coming months, if you listen to the first readings, you're going to hear more stories about marriages, about children, about war, about friendship, about national leadership and transition of power. These things are all still happening now for us. And it's important to see what God has done in the past. We read these stories now as Christians in the light of Jesus' teachings and the way that he led his life and the things that he taught us. As Samuel did long ago, I call you to listen to God. Listen to the word of the Lord when he comes to you and respond as Samuel did Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And as God speaks to you and draws you on in your life, you will grow into God's message and God's plans and God's promises to you. Let us pray. Insistent God, by day and night you summon your slumbering people. So stir us with your voice and enlighten our lives with your grace that we give ourselves fully to Christ's call for mission and ministry. Amen. <laughs>